It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare, as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hello everybody, this is Tyler Preston 20. I'm with a very special guest. Her name is Ziamara Ramirez. She's a Spanish immigrant from the Canary Islands, and we're going to talk about some current events in Spain. How are you doing? Hey, Tyler. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. I'm just curious. Just what inspired you to move to the United States? Were you kind of worried about the direction in your country? Well, I always loved the United States. I have family here, they've been living here forever, my cousins were born in here. So I've been here before on vacation and I really love it. Then that makes the decision easier, you know, like at one side having family, at the other side having visiting before and knowing a little about the economy situation, how it works and everything. So. Yeah, it was like the easiest decision ever once you decide that you want to move out of your own country. What made me decide about moving out of my own country was a little bit of everything. The economy was going really bad, but also the solutions that were that were applying weren't like the best solution ever. So I was thinking this is not going to be better. Like. Sometimes you can think, okay, let me just sacrifice myself, wait a little bit and things will work. But no, the way everything was happening, it wasn't like getting better. And at one point also, the, there was this new communist party uh, growing up. Also, protests in the street for reasons that I, th I wasn't thinking like they were legitimate reasons at that moment. Like, we had more important things to care about it. <laughs> and uh, I mean, communist. Communist is the war. When you see communists growing, run away. When you arrived to the United States, did you experience any culture shock? Was it hard learning the language and adjusting to mannerisms? Yeah, the language, the language was the first shock. Because till you don't really learn the language and can have a conversation, you can get into the culture, right? So I, I've been studying English in my life, but it was till I was 14 years old. After that, I began to study other language. So it was kind of like a part in my mind, almost forget about it. And then also I studied British English. So there's a big difference, you know, you move here and you go like Harry Potter and they go like Harry Potter, what are you talking about? <laughs> also the accents, American accent is completely different than British accent. And then uh, I'm in New York City, which here it lives people from all over the world. So it's not the same an Indian person speaking in English or a Chinese person speaking in English, a Greek person speaking in English. Like, it was hard. It was really hard to get used to different accents and speaking in a language that is not the same kind of English that I studied. But yeah, once I handled that, I began to focus more about cultures. And that was my second issue. What is the American culture? Like, I was seeing people from all over the world, as I said, and each one has like, their own different culture, even being living in America. Uh, that was hard. Like I had to learn to be careful, to don't speak about religion, to don't speak about politics, which at the same time impressed me a lot. Like, hey, we have the Statue of Liberty right there, right? For what? If I'm going to be scared of saying what I'm thinking about anything. But I don't think it's, a, it's an American thing. I think that is what happened when it comes to the multicultural thing. You know, like multicultural means freedom of speech is done. But don't get me wrong, it's not the people who goes against the freedom of speech. It is the government and those movements that are making noise all over. 
Because when you get close to the people, like I remember having conversation with one lady from Palestina and one lady from Israel, and we were talking about it and no one got mad. And I had conversations with an Ukrainian and a Russian about the issue with them and no one got mad. It is everything about the these stupid movements that are taking the streets and making noise and protesting and complaining for things that are not part of the real life in New York? Well, the illegal immigration is not that easy. Again, I live in New York City, uh, so I know every time I order delivery, the guy that is going to deliver the food is illegal. That's something that all the New Yorkers know. And I mean, those guys can be here illegally, but that doesn't mean they are going to commit any other crime. You know, they are working hard many of them actually, since they usually buy illegal papers, they are paying taxes. They cannot get taxes in return, but they can pay them. So it's a hard thing to, to say. Like I've been reading that 75% of the legal immigration in United States come legally. They come by plane or by boats that are legal. So the issue goes when they are in United States and their visa expired. Then is when they stay illegally, which is an offense, it's not a real crime. The crime comes when you cross the border illegally, like those people coming from uh, Latin America by the borders. That doesn't mean they are necessarily Mexican. There's people from all over the world that goes by that border anyway. The whole point about crossing the border illegally, it is about the human traffic. It is dangerous for themselves. Here in the city, I was here just for a year when I met this girl, she was from Venezuela. She was 19 years old by that time, and she was living in United States for a year already. When she crossed the border, it took her almost a month. Her family used the whole money they could save for her to cross the border, they sent her alone, and she was being raped every single night for a month. That's the issue, the biggest issue for me about the legal immigration. It is hard for them, and it is dangerous for them. Then, many of those that cross the border illegally at the same time, they do it on that way because they know what they want to do in America, well, in United States, is going to be illegal too. They want to uh, laundry money, they want to do drug business, or things like that. So it is a balance, you know? There's people and there's people illegally. It's not an ish, an, a really easy issue. Of course, if they are coming by thousands, you have to stop it. Every single country in the world has to control their borders, because if you don't know what kind of people is coming inside, you don't know about their intentions, you don't know if they are sick, you don't know what else they are bringing with themselves, it's dangerous. It is really dangerous. So it is something that it doesn't have, it doesn't have a, an easy solution. But yeah, of course, the first solution is close the borders and control that. Like I'm saying, 75% of the illegal immigrants come in a legal way, which it means uh, the United States government knows about their backgrounds, knows about their sickness, knows, you know, kind of know wh why are they coming to this country and allows them to get into, even if it's just on vacation. Speaking about the complicities of illegal immigration, more recently in Spain, a new president was elected. His name is Pablo Sanchez. Who is he and what, par and what party does he follow? Well, first of all, he wasn't elected. There was, a, let's say, an impeachment to the elected president because there was some corruption in his party, which is pretty funny because, yeah, there's corruption in every single party in Spain, you know? 
but they just pretend. It was really funny. So they did an impeachment, and uh, the second one who got more votes in the past elections was the one who became president, Pedro Sánchez. He is the leader of the Socialist Party in Spain. He actually made kind of a coalition with communists and independents to get the power. And, uh, well, he is socialist. That says everything, right? <laughs> My mistake. Speaking about the parties, like, what are the names of the parties within the political sphere in Spain besides the Socialist Party that Pablo is a part of? There's four big parties in Spain right now. Partido Popular, uh, it used to be the right wing. They're not anymore, even when they think they are, they're not. Then it comes the Socialist Party, which is the government right now. Uh, then it comes Ciudadanos, which is again, kind of like in the middle. It's not a right wing and it's not a left wing. They don't even know where they are. And then it comes Podemos, which is communist. It's communist. They call themselves uh, like socialist and something like that, but <laughs> they are communist. Speaking about the Podemos party, isn't it true that they call themselves Nosotras? <laughs> yeah, you know, they have been losing votes in the last month because many people is beginning to realize that they are as any kind of communist, you know, which it means everything for me but nothing for you. Uh, I'm the most capitalist all over. So now they are playing those kind of games. Like they support the feminists, they support the gay movement, they support like any kind of movement that make noise, they go there. So yeah, now they are using the feminine of the words while they are talking about themselves, which is pretty funny at the same time because many of those times that they use it, there's no woman around. So you see a bunch of men speaking as if they were females. I'm sure they are trying to pretend like, hey, when we speak in plural, we, we should use the feminine and everything. You know, those kind of really important things to rescue a country. For everybody else who don't know what nosotros means, basically like we and us, there's the word nosotros, but nosotras basically just refers to the females of us and uh, we. Speaking about which, uh, Spain right now is facing a refugee crisis. What led to this refugee crisis that we're seeing on the news right now? So, in 2015, when the European Union decided to open the borders, yes, they decided. <laughs> uh, from the beginning, the most of the immigrants that were coming by the Mediterranean Sea were arriving by Greece and by Italy, right? But then, Greece and Italy say, like, we're done, okay? We're done with this. Greece didn't really say, it's just that they are assuming immigrants by the sea and by the borders on the land, so they can afford anymore. And Italy, yeah, they say, we're done. And actually now they have Matteo Salvini as a president. He's amazing. And he seriously did it. He closed the whole borders of Italy. Not even one more immigrant can get into so, which is the next step, the next country from Europe that goes to the Mediterranean Sea? Spain. So there you go. Everybody's coming to Spain right now. And since at the same time we have uh, two territories in Africa in the north, uh, Ceuta and Melilla, it's even, let's say, easier, you know, like you are already in Morocco, you just have to cross my border. And actually, with a socialist president, as we have, it's even more easy. The other day, uh, I don't know if like 800 immigrants crossed that border in one of those territories in Ceuta. And uh, they attack our police with biological weapons and uh, with um, fire. Oh, I don't know how you call them, those sprites that have fire. And also, another thing that I don't know how to say it in English is a white powder that burns when it touches your skin. So, yeah, they were like attacking us. And uh, many of our police people is, on, is in hospital. But our president came out just saying, like, oh my God, I just hope all the immigrants are fine. 
awesome, you know? Someone attack your borders, someone attack your citizens, and that's the way you come back. But it doesn't surprise me. A couple of weeks ago, one night, my president from Spain was meeting George Soros, who we all know he's in the back of everything. And next day he was meeting Angela Merkel just to tell her, hey, of course we're opening our borders. There you go. We're having more immigrants in these past uh, six, seven months already getting into Spain than in all the whole past year. The thing with the fire is called a flamethrower. As for the other description, I have no idea what you're talking about. But um, do you think that the whole entire refugee crisis in Spain essentially is entirely Sanchez's fault? No, of course not. He's just a puppet, you know? Someone is moving him. He is just a puppet. And that is what is going on right now all over Europe. All our governments are puppets. Based upon the footage of what we see so far in Spain, are you worried that your country might end up like Sweden or Germany? Yes, I am really worried. Since I've been writing about it for a year already, I've seen how Sweden is, how France, how Germany, how United Kingdom, Greece, Italy, there's many countries already that are almost done. A United Nations man that was sent to investigate what was going on in Sweden, when he came back to the United Nations, he said, Sweden has no hope. The country, as we used to knew it, is gone. I don't think even a civil war will save Sweden. So I look to my country and I'm really scared. Part of me wants to be positive and think, hey, we have our past, we have our history, it is in, on, on our DNA, you know? But, wow, it's a big thing right now. Because back then, the governments were in our back. They were the ones who want to get bigger and take care of the citizens, of the identity of the country. Now, the governments are our enemies. Do you think the best solution for your country is to have a Brexit? That would be a first step, but look the Brexit in United Kingdom, right? They have the Brexit, but it's not real, because in the end, the decisions that are making their government, Theresa May, <laughs> is like, yeah, okay, we are outside of the European Union, but guess what? Their courts are going to still rule in our cases. We are going to be still in deals under the European Union rules and things like that. So it's like the fake Brexit ever. They are acting as traitors against their own population who vote for the Brexit. So I think that will be the, the game if we have a Brexit in Spain, right? And a Spanexit or a Spain six. No, I don't even know how to say it. European Union anyway loves to play that game. In the past, we've seen it. Ireland twice voted no for different issues related to the European Union, and they pushed them to vote again till they got the results they were expecting. So European Union is the biggest lie ever. There's no way they are going to allow the countries to get out of it. Because actually what they want is new countries to get into. The final plan is the globalist government. Just think one little detail. When they set ready the European Union and they make all those laws, that kind of fake constitution and everything, there's no article about what if I want to leave the European Union. That says everything. Considering what's happening right now with the refugee crisis in Spain, do you have any hope left for your country? I mean, after all, Spanish people, they once conquered the world and were very strong. <laughs> There's a famous saying, just don't expect the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> well, when we conquer the world, let me tell you something that many people doesn't know. Actually, many people from Spain doesn't know about it. We were just five million. Back then, we were just five million people, and still, we let's say we conquered the world, right? So yeah, that's my hope. It is on our DNA. Back then, we kick out the Ottomans, 
the the Muslim Imperium because they were inviting us even when people wants to say no they were conquering no they were inviting if you think Spaniards were inviting when they arrived to America then the Muslims were inviting Europe when they arrived to Europe it's the same situation an Imperium wants to grow and they look for new land so other than that the Inquisition is another funny is, is another funny subject because there's a lot of lies around it, you know. The Spanish Inquisition wasn't the worst ever. The Germanic one was much worse than the Spaniard. And actually the Spaniard had just, uh, they were allowed to act just against the Christians, which it means they weren't allowed to act against Muslims or against uh, Jews. Just the Jews and Muslims that were convert into the Catholic religion. But, you know, whoever wrote the history... Ah. So yeah, because it's in our DNA, I have a hope. But at the same time, they've been training these new generations for many years to accept the new reality, okay? Uh, they change actually the education system in Spain in, uh, 19, in 1990 and since then they've been training them for this moment. They had uh, subjects as education for the citizens where they were teaching how to be open to the diversity and how to have the borders open and things like that. So we're talking all the people in Spain that is under 34 years old has been training for this moment to accept it. On a very, very high note, thanks for coming on, Ms. Ramirez. Uh, what's your social media account and where can people find you? <laughs> well, I'm on Twitter. It would be at Xiaomi RB. My name goes with an X, so it's really weird. And also I help on Dissidencias, the website. I write articles for them. And well, thank you so much for everything. It was a pleasure. I had fun talking with you. I hope the people can understand me because of my accent in English, as I was saying. <laughs> Bye. Oh, don't worry, your Spanish accent is fine and everybody else could hear you just fine. Thanks everybody for watching. If you want to see more of Ramirez's works, go to her social media accounts. Until next time, guys, have an awesome day.